in wherever uh, you all are. I'm Alan Des Jardins. I'm one of the regional technical managers here in North America. And um, this optimizing PTP performance presentation, mostly based on uh, unlicensed and lightly licensed products, but some of the tips will will apply to licensed radios as well. Um, mostly a uh, culmination of my experiences dealing with customers um, over the years and, and things that combination of things I wish they knew before they installed the links and things that we were able to do after they installed the links to make performance work a little better. So on to the next slide. Just a quick overview of how, how the flow of this is going to go. Um, we're going to start with reviewing di design goals and choices, um, the physical environment, the spectral environment, and then we get into the actual under the hood settings that might be able to you might be able to utilize to improve performance of an existing link. So next slide. So as I say here, it all starts with a plan. Um, we recommend the use of our link planner tool. Um, you'll find that it is comparable with many of the expensive paid link planning programs, but it has the benefit of being free to uh, anybody who's willing to go to this link and download it. Um, other tools that are very useful, Google Earth is, is very useful, and uh, handheld GPS or smartphone GPS can be useful for collecting coordinates of locations to enter into those two products to, uh, to get a look at, uh, at where things are. But uh, strongly recommend, even if you've already deployed a link, if you think you're not getting the performance you should, let's put it in Link Planner. So next slide, please. So why do we recommend this? Well, Link Planner tells you exactly what the link should be capable of. As long as we put all the right data into it, um, it'll it'll turn out a result. And the reason for this is it, it happens more often than I like, but uh, first-time link purchasers, especially end-user purchasers, will read a data sheet and see that a product like the PTP450 is capable of 450 megabits per second. And they'll also see that it's capable of connecting past you know, 40 miles or, or 60 kilometers on, with certain antennas. And they'll mentally map in their mind that it can do both things at the same time. And that is rarely the, uh, the case in these things. It's sort of like uh, my car can go, you know, 70 miles per hour and it can drive on dirt roads but uh, driving my little Hyundai on 70 miles per hour on a dirt road would be uh, a very exciting ride. Uh, next slide please. So while I intended to dive right into the link planner through showing some results, um, this isn't a link planner class. We have them on occasion. Uh, stay tuned to the same place we signed up for this link for link planner classes. And also the quick start guide in the uh, the help sec. If you just download Link Planner and go to help link and the PDF manual and go to the quick start, it can get you up and creating links very quickly. Next slide, please. So what's my link really capable of? This is an example of a link that I've ins inserted into this particular one. This one is in uh, Quebec somewhere in, in, in Canada, um, and, it, uh, and it shows a few things right off the bat. We see that the link distance in this particular case is somewhere just past 2.6 miles. We see we're coming from a, a fairly high location on one side to a fairly low location on the other side, and we see a few things that have been input into the design right off the bat. Uh, the PTP650 has been chosen as the product that they want to use for this link. Um, they're using a full capacity radio, which means that if everything else is, is working and capable, it will deliver up to 450 megabits per second. Um, in this particular case, though, they've got the, the bandwidth set to 20 megahertz. Um, that directly relates to, to the, cap the throughput capability, uh, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit more detail. Um, and you can see that the path is resting right on the earth uh, near the edge of the, uh, the client location to the right on this, this diagram. So next slide, please. This is where we dig in a little bit. I, I read some of these things already, the, the equipment, the, the product, the, the capability, and the bandwidth setting, um, the conditions that have been put into the product. 
Um, and you'll see at the bottom there's a little result line there, profile 2.7 miles near line of sight. That means we don't have absolute line of sight on this path. And in fact, not all the data has been input in, into this path. This, is, this was the working process of an actual path I did recently. Um, next slide, please. Before we added the other detail, the client in this particular case wanted 12 megabits per second in each direction for the link. And based on just a raw earth profile, you can see that this link should be capable of performing that, but, but it won't be, and you'll see why in just a moment. I do want to point out, as we look at this, this particular chart in Link Planner, a very common misconception a lot of people have is they look at the bold numbers in the center where it says aggregate IP throughput 448.29 megabits per second. Um, I just want to make absolutely clear what that number is telling you is absolutely everything conditionally perfect moments in time, um, the most that could possibly go through this link. But again, we, we have to have absolutely everything aligned align to perfection for this number to be achievable. Um, the stair-step diagram a little bit to the, to the lower section of the page tells you what the link is actually capable of at various throughputs. So if you look along the, the, uh, the vertical axis on the left, it shows you the link availability and the 99.999% is generally what we call the uh, the telecom comparison. That's the uh, sort of number somebody who's leasing a circuit from from a, a major service provider would advertise their link availability. So that is generally our reference of comparison. Um, and you'll see it, at that availability, this path provided everything everything was as input um, is just past 100 megabits per second. And then it quickly drops off to just three nines of availability. The important thing on, on this particular diagram, to get the numbers you want, um, know what you're trying to achieve. And sometimes the, the, the achievable number is often just as much as I can get. But Sometimes it's a very specific number. I'm backhauling four video cameras, and and I need at least 10 megabits of, of uh, throughput for general computer use. And you could sort of tally those numbers up and come up with a minimum IP required number. That's where this number came from. It was a certain number of uh, video cameras that were being, being monitored and controlled. Um, but it's really important to put your requirements into that and design the link based on those requirements. Next slide, please. And this particular path, and say it was showing that the the we're near line of sight, we're resting right on the Earth. Next slide, please. After that, I usually use Google Earth in Link Planner. There's a little link if you've got Google Earth installed in your in your laptop. You just click the picture of a globe at the top of Link Planner, and it pops open your path across the Earth. And you can see we're going across some obstructions here. Most specifically, um, on the right-hand side, there are some points that mark out HP. Those are the highest points of the link. The two, high, two or three highest points of the link are already identified for you. So those are the things I tend to zoom in on and get a closer look at. The next slide shows a ground level, a street view uh, near one of those high points. And I do a comparison against against uh, trees and phone poles. If so you you spin around in this, unfortunately, my picture didn't capture it very well. You can see a, a phone pole up next to a tree. Phone poles tend to be right around 40 feet tall, sometimes shorter. I like to use uh, worst case numbers as my 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 predictions. So I, I came up with a tree height of 50 feet across this this particular area, and I entered that into, into Link Planner, and the next slide shows the result. So you can see we went from an okay path to a totally not workable path in this case. We're going through more than uh, a mile of trees um, below grade on this particular particular path. This is the, the important reality that, that often gets put in, and it is amazing how often I will have people who will purchase a product because they drive between this client location, remote office, and the main factory where the chimney is every day, and to them on their drive, it seems perfectly flat. 
But when we project it into Google, Google Earth um, and, and see the terrain model here, we see that it is not perfectly flat. It just your sensations as you as you drive across this path fool you. Um, you miss the the ups and the downs. They're more exaggerated than you realize. And then when we add the uh, the tree cover to it, it's much worse than that. So in this particular scenario, if the height I was given for the client location was as high as I was allowed to go, it would it would be pretty much game over on this particular one. Next slide, please. And this uh, this shows the result based on the trees added to it that we we have no throughput available at all at least at, at five gigahertz on this path. Next slide, please. We did in this particular case get permission to put up a mast and elevate the antenna and get a near line of sight path that was acceptable. You can see if I'm not sure how well it shows up on your computer, but down at the bottom. You can see we we meet better than four nines and five nines availability at the 12 megabits per second required based on the new height. So we were able to make it work, but again, it's a matter of having expectations and measuring against them that may is the key here. Next slide. So the spectral environment. So we, we assume we get a we've got a path up and working. Um, other things that involve it, or especially in our unlicensed and lightly licensed products, is the other things around us. We can generally assume in a licensed band, if everybody is playing nicely, that uh, our products like our PTP 800, 810, and 820 should operate interference-free if properly coordinated. Um, and our unlicensed products, however. We need to take a look at the at the world as it's presented to us, and the onboard spectrum analyzer available in all of our point to point products is a great tool to take the guesswork out. Next slide. So this is the spectrum analyzer capture, and this is from a PTP 450 uh, product, and this is an actual uh, desired install that uh, we did in New York State not too very long ago. You can see from the spectrum analyzer, if you uh, if you read this, the the bumps projecting up across the uh, across the uh, what's the best way to say this from so from left to right we're going up in frequency, and then the vertical axis is the amount of energy present in the band, and pretty much anything higher than the negative 90 position on our uh, on our spectrum graph is going to cause us issues if we try to operate in that particular frequency. In all cases, we should try and go for the quietest we can, but there's some other things that affect that decision. Next slide, please. Okay, so I, I, uh, so I, I got a little more detail. You can see the frequencies in use and the apparent openings that, that are there. We're going to talk through some of these openings. Some of these issues I'm going to talk through are specific to North America, and some of them are, are commonly replicated over most of the globe. So next slide, please. Actually, let's go back to the last slide. I guess I will, I will, I will talk through some of this. So as we look across these, uh, this, this piece of spectrum that the PTP450 can operate, this particular particular product, um, it can operate from the 5.4 band all the way up to the 5758 band, but not all of these these frequencies that we're looking across uh, behave equally based on regulatory decisions that different countries impose. Here in North America, U.S., Canada, and Mexico predominantly behave much the same way. The uh, signals you see above 5720 up to 5845. Uh, 45 up in that up in that range, or we're allowed we're allowed to operate the highest output power, uh, the highest uh, effective radiated power. That makes it a particularly desirable portion of the band for doing long distance links and for doing point to multi point connections, especially when you might need to penetrate a little bit of tree cover and things like that. As we go down in the uh, the spectrum here. Um, Right at about uh, 5670, you'll see see some bumps in there, 
And that particular area in this, in this region where this was captured, um, there's actually airport radar there that we need to protect and avoid. Our radar radios are already programmed, if, they, if you've set the correct country code in them, to recognize this radar signature and prevent you from operating on those frequencies. But we can see them in operation right here. We go down a little little further to the, the 55, uh, somewhere around 5585, I'm thinking, is about where that, that other signal is centered. That's another point-to-multipoint -point system that's in the area. And then there's another one a little lower in frequency. And those particular frequencies, we get uh, less range. So up at the 5.8 band, up at the far right-hand side, it's not uncommon to make 10-plus mile point-to-multi-point -point connections and the longest distance point-to-point -point connections. As we go down in frequency, we're talking under five mile point-to-multi-point -point connections and seven to ten mile maximum point-to-point uh, -point connections by point-to-multi-point. -point. Yeah, uh, hopefully I didn't confuse those. Anyway. That's what's going on in the spectrum grass, and that's what drives some of our, our choices. So looking at this, we have some choices to make. First, looking back at our link planner, how far are we trying to link? If it were the, the path I were looking at earlier, about three, less than three miles, just about anywhere on the spectrum that I can find clean spectrum is going to be fine. Um, if I'm going longer than that, and for the particular for the sake of this discussion, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that we are. I might need more power. I use Link Planner to verify that I'm going to get the results I need at the distance. And then I come back and find the hole in the spectrum that I want to operate in. And this particular one, I'm going to say that we're going to try and make a signal work at 5795. You can see the hole between the two, the two signals there. We're going to try and drop in a long-range connection right there. Next slide, please. Let's see, I talked through those already. Sorry, I already did that. So next slide, please. So we've zeroed down into the piece of spectrum that we're going to try and operate in. Um, we've run it in Link Planner to make sure that the path should work. Next slide. So I want to point out some of the hardware choices. If we're, we haven't already deployed a product and we're just looking at, at deploying something, um, this is a, a good scenario where your hardware choice can definitely definitely make a big difference on the result you'll get. Uh, the PTP 700, 650, and the 450i series radios all include a digital signal processing intermediate frequency filter that significantly cuts the uh, the interference out uh, directly above and below the the, uh, the spectrum that you're trying to occupy. Um, other radios, the standard P PTP450, the uh, EPMP-based uh, uh, point-to-point links, um, listen a little more linearly right across their operating spectrum and can be, can be influenced significantly by, by strong noise just above or below the frequency that we care about, which can impact performance. So if you know you're getting into a spectrally confined environment, and you need to sort of thread the needle to make a signal work between a, between a high noise floor, I strongly recommend you look at these, these radios as your go-to um, to get the best performance out of them. Um, and, and in that, in my experience, um, having the, 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 the newer DSP-based radios um, can make the difference between a link performing and not performing at all and can make dramatic and improve improvements in the throughput performance of a link. Next slide, please. So we're assuming in this particular case that we don't have the I version of the radio. We're just using a standard radio. So what else can we do? Well, one of the things we can do is if we can, we can tolerate the amount of throughput offered, we can reduce our channel bandwidth. You can see uh, about fifth item down on the menu, the channel bandwidth setting. Depending on the, the uh, firmware you're running on your radio, you may have 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz channels available. Or if you're running in a, a 3 gigahertz product, you may also have 3.5 and, and 7 megahertz channels available as well. Um, 
the channel bandwidths directly relate to the amount of throughput. So in the case of a PTP 450, for example, we say that the 450 product has about 125 megabits per second of maximum throughput between devices. That's based on a 20 megahertz channel. So if I drop to a 10 megahertz channel, I have exactly half of that throughput. And if I drop to a 5 megahertz channel, I have half again, or, or a quarter of the available throughput available to me. So just know those, those implications. But sometimes running narrower and cleanly will yield more usable throughput than running wider and interfered with. Next slide, please. So yeah, this, this shows the occupied bandwidth uh, relationship. It's especially, especially easy on the PTP650 product, which the ratings for its maximum throughput are based on a 45 megahertz per channel at 10 bits per hertz. That's where our 450 megabits per second of aggregate throughput comes. So it's, it's a simple, if you reduce that uh, bandwidth number to 30, you now have a 300 meg radio, to 10, you have a 100 meg radio, et cetera. And that, that again, is based on uh, a perfect link. Um, other things like your antenna sizes and obstructions will, will in, impact that further. Next slide. So other things that uh, channel bandwidth will result in, especially with the PTP 650 and 700 radios, um, I have seen people trying to get the most throughput run the 45 uh, megahertz channel with significant noise on the, up above and below it and get disappointing throughput results. And when we dropped to a 30 megahertz channel, because it could run cleanly, it was able to shift from single mode where it sends the same data, both vertical and horizontal, to, in, to, uh, to stack the odds for the best reception to unique data on vertical and horizontal and actually increase the throughput in that comparison. The same thing happens on the, the 450 and the EPMP products. MIMO mode A puts the same data on vertical and horizontal or slant left and right, uh, plus and minus on those radios to protect the transmission and then we'll shift to B where it puts unique data on those two polarizations um, when, the, when the spectrum is clean enough. So be willing to experiment, try, try different combinations and test repeatedly to find the one that gives you the best performance, especially in an interfered environment. Next slide, please. So we've done every, uh, oh goodness, my, I see my spell check failed me. Uh, so you ran the path in Link Planner, added obstructions, the noise floor, built-in spectrumizer, it looked clean, but the link is still underperforming. What's left that we can, we can do? And this last one is about antenna alignment. Next slide, please. I have run into countless uh, links that have been fine-tuned to what's called a side lobe. You can see this picture right here. Every antenna has side lobes. That's uh, points where there's radiated significant energy, but it's generally the difference between the first side lobe you see off of the main lobe, the dark green in the center, is generally 10 to 15 dB down. Um, so this is where it's really important to have good data in your link planner so you know what you're comparing it to. If link planner said you should have a neg 60 dBm receive level and you're looking at the best you can find is a neg 70, recheck your angles, resweep your antennas both left and right and up and down because this phenomena happens in three dimensions. It's just been flattened to a single dimension to make it easier to see um, and, and repeat that antenna. I don't know how many times I've had underperforming links and this was the solution, that it had been, been aimed to a side lobe. And the shorter the link, the easier it is to have this happen to you. Um, those links that are not very long but just further than the naked eye can see are the ones most at risk to have this happen because the side lobe looks very strong. And if you're not comparing it to a known metric that you're trying to hit, it's easy to get stuck on that. Next slide, please. So like I said, the typical side lobe is 
10 to 15 dB down, and because of that, the link will be will, will may give what I call great sunny day performance. But the first bad weather day, uh, the first other radio to come on the air and present interference, and and the uh, the issues pop up much faster than they would on a properly aimed link. Next slide, please. And then finally, the mechanics. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a high gain point-to-point uh, -point link, and what you see coming out of the bottom of it is acorns. A squirrel had made a hole in the uh, weatherproofing cover on it and was storing them for the winter. The result of this is the link slowly degraded over time to the point where it was underperforming and, and needed to be inspected. And this is one of the things. Animal damage is a real thing. It happens to us all over the world. We also have weather. Um, recheck the, uh, the coaxial connections or waveguide connections that you're using and make sure that they haven't been weather or lightning damaged. Um, after a while, stuff ages, and it, and it just needs to be looked at. Um, I've had uh, birds decide to peck through coax cables. Um, water intrusion on, on something that wasn't properly weather sealed, and of course this. And and again, the over time realignment issues as well. Next slide, and I think this might be, yeah, we're heading to the end of it. So tip for tips like this, I recommend the uh, the Cambium community, community page, but there are other ways to, to, to follow us, and these are some of them as well. Through, so these various social media, next slide, and the community. This is the one, yeah, this is my favorite. Um, as I discover new and interesting things as, a, as one of the RTMs, we all input them into, these, into the community so that others can benefit from them. Um, if issues are discovered with products when they're released, they, those go in there quickly. Um, anything, and you'll see uh, uh, tips and, and trips for, um, from other users like yourselves in here quite a bit. In fact, some of those are the most valuable contributions we get. So if you do something interesting, creative, discover a, a problem nobody else has discovered, we'd love to hear about it. Please join our community and enter them right here. And who knows, from time to time, our marketing folks even, even award prizes based on the, uh, the interesting and creative uh, things that get put in there. And with that, uh, I think the, the final slide is the thank you. That, uh, that is the end of my presentation. I thank you all for coming. And if you have questions, we can, we can, I suppose we can open it up for that. Yeah, I was going to say, if anyone has questions, please feel free to fill them out on the chat window on the side. Um, but we'll give that a couple seconds here, Alan, and I'll keep you posted if anything comes in. But I want to thank you again for a great, great presentation and a great insight. So um, it was really good. I want to thank you for that. But at this point, Alan, we do not have any more questions going on here. So I just want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, and you guys will be getting this sent in an email as well. So I just want to thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, have a good day. Thank you, everyone.